My work begins outside uh, the pavilion with this performance called uh, the designated entrance. Basically, the performers are the exhibition guides uh, and uh, they perform themselves. Their role is to um, divide the audience uh, into two categories. Um, so what we did was to close the main entrance of the exhibition, which is uh, usually used as entrance. Uh, and uh, the audience has to enter the space from one of the two side entrances, which are kind of marked with these um, arrows designed by our exhibition designer. Um, and um, this process of um, dividing the audience, basically it's a random process. So the audience doesn't have choice from which one of uh, entrances to enter, but um, these guides um, randomly send them to left and uh, right. And uh, by this uh, randomizing, I'm referring to um, um, to privileges that are assigned to us um, uh, when we are born, that we don't have any choice about them and they are, they are, we, we are basically born into them. Because how I also see um, life of uh, Emily Rosalisa is that she wasn't um, um, a completely from a um, humble background uh, like uh, the majority of Estonians. So she had education in Russia and she, ha she had some basic privileges, uh, which in my opinion also helped her to continue her path. Uh, of course, if she lived in Estonia, she wouldn't have those uh, privileges that she later gained, but also she was um, rather privileged from the beginning because her father was a paint master. Uh, in Russia, and he, she had the chance to educate herself there. Their costumes are uh, designed by um, two uh, Estonian designers, uh, Karol Ott and uh, uh, Tuli Kipel, um, in collaboration with myself. So they are conceptualized by Karol and uh, um, realized by Tuli uh, The character of the performers is kind of um, fluid and it has this duality that is present in the exhibition, um, kind of in one. So um, the, the costumes are rather rough and uh, maybe serious looking, uh, uh, but on the other hand, the fabric has uh, herbarium uh, implemented in it, which kind of softens it and uh, <laughs> uh, maybe changes a little bit. Uh, may, uh, and then there's the um, sign exhibition guard, which is um, uh, embroidery, which also refers to the practice of, um, yeah, um, uh, the fact that basically education, art education for women was for them to learn to uh, make handicraft and embroidery. And uh, the other one, the practice of making herbarium was a very Western practice to preserve plants and uh, um, so the yeah again the two sides of uh, um, the characters of our protagonists are present in one in in these characters and their costumes. The experience of the exhibition is slightly different based on which entrance you enter the space and uh, the way you um, have the first kind of impression of the space. This performance kind of uh, refers to um, uh, class divisions in architecture, um, which has been present in uh, Dutch colonial architecture and also in uh, uh, Estonian manor houses. The main entrance uh, of manor uh, houses were usually reserved for the nobility and uh, the servant class has to, had to enter the space from uh, side entrances. In this case, the privileged audience of uh, Venice and Giardini um, has to take the side entrance, one of the side entrances to the space. And then um, when the audience enters from uh, this entrance uh, uh, on the right side of the pavilion, they enter, they kind of uh, walk um, on this platform. Um, which is uh, 105 centimeters above the ground. 
and uh, they kind of have a um, different view to the exhibition. They have a vantage point of view. Um, and they are at the height that uh, the other um, audience members are kind of symbolically at their feet level. Um, from this point, there is a very um, good, um, basically, um, angle or view to um, this other uh, work, this light installation, uh, which is a site-specific work uh, for this specific uh, space. The ones who, um, uh, who climb the platform are capable of activating this uh, kinetic sculpture, um, which I explain uh, more about it again. Um, the material of the platform is uh, marble imitation and uh, a very thin layer of teak uh, veneer on the side. And uh, both materials are kind of um, historical references to different conditions that kind of enabled some people to climb over others. Um, and in this case, uh, uh, the fake marble or marble imitation uh, refers to uh, this um, weaving movement in Indonesia, which uh, uh, was against the um, um, mining of marble in a, in a um, sacred uh, site called Muthis uh, Mountain. Uh, and the teak refers to another um, resistant movement of uh, Sami people against uh, exploitation of uh, teak forest. Uh, both of these um, materials were basically uh, heavily uh, extracted in Indonesia and uh, um, caused destruction of landscape. Um, also, the marble um, is kind of a doppelganger of the marble in the entrance of the pavilion um, and imitates uh, that as... as uh, um, some sort of uh, space of uh, privilege, uh, this uh, veranda-like uh, space uh, in front of the pavilion. This, this position, like these two positions, also kind of refer to these um, different perspectives that are present in the exhibition in different works, uh, this um, outsider and insider gaze, colonizer, colonized, uh, and uh, also form-wise, these... Um, lines uh, kind of relate to Christina's uh, film, uh, the episode filmed in the zoo. Uh, so there is this uh, moment, I hope that this, this would also be perceived not only as a stage or a higher platform, but it's sort of uh, also a, some sort of a um, cage, like, uh, because uh, in a way also it, it limits your access to the rest of the space as well. Um, this is a project that I titled Orchid Delirium. Uh, orchid Delirium is a term that refers to the orchid madness that happened at the 19th century where uh, people in Europe were uh, obsessed with orchids and um, these orchids were so sought after and they were sourced from these indigenous contexts um, outside of Europe. Um, and in some cases these orchids were more expensive than jewels. And in the exhibition, um, Orchid Delirium is uh, for us a metaphor to discuss these uh, entangled histories of um, colonialism uh, between Estonia, the Netherlands, and uh, Indonesia. And this is the first time that our um, artistic team um, has dealt with this topic. So it's been a very exciting, uh, long uh, learning process for us as well. And I am very um, excited to be working with um, two artists, uh, Christina Norman and Bita Razavi, and also a host of collaborators, advisors who have contributed so much to this project. Um, one of uh, the collaborators uh, who is very important, uh, Eko Suprianto, uh, has uh, also um, a video intervention inside the exhibition that I will talk about later. Um, and for us, it was very important to, to build this dialogue and to kind of guide each other through this, through this process. Uh, how do we open up these very, um, you know, 
painful memories, uh, these histories which are so complex. Um, and um, in the end, uh, we decided to incorporate multiple voices and different perspectives uh, who don't always overlap uh, and to present this, uh, to present this topic for, for audiences. Um, and uh, the exhibition is conceived as this uh, immersive environment. Uh, it is meant to be like a, a collaboration. Um, so inside it, you will uh, find different histories that uh, run against each other, sometimes overlap. Um, and the inspiration for the project uh, began, I think, over two years ago, uh, when I had a conversation with uh, Christina Norman. We were looking at uh, mounting this exhibition that would deal with colonial histories and Estonia's role in colonial histories, not only from the point of view of being colonized by foreign powers, uh, such as you know, the Russian Empire, uh, but also Estonians' roles as colonizers. Um, and we came across the biography of Andres Sal, uh, who was an Estonian uh, topographer, writer, world traveler, and uh, what stood out for us was that uh, Andres Sal's um, partner, Emily Rosalie Sal, was a painter of uh, botanical um, art. Um, at the time, botanical art was a kind of pastime that uh, women um, could undertake they were, when they were not allowed to have a real job. And it was kind of a means for them to realize themselves, to kind of express themselves. And uh, Emily and uh, Andres had a you know, remarkable biography that really fascinated us. Um, he uh, was um, promoted quite quickly uh, from um, somebody coming from Estonia, from very kind of humble origins, from, from this village basically, uh, to running the <clears throat> topography bureau in the service of the Dutch colonial army on the island of Java in uh, Indonesia, which was then called the Dutch East Indies uh, during the late colonial period, that is uh, the beginning of um, the 1900s. And uh, he and Emily spent over 20 years there uh, while he was um, working for the army and taking photographs and writing. Uh, she dedicated her time to creating over 300 of these incredible drawings of local um, flowers, plants, vegetables, and so on. Um, and so we kind of began to research her story, which is a unique story that is actually not even well known in Estonia because uh, her own life and her work were not considered important enough to be preserved in, in the archives in Estonia. And uh, we found uh, only copies of these works that she did in Indonesia, uh, all the way in the United States, uh, where she and uh, Andres um, uh, retired and they eventually became American citizens. And I felt like um, both me and uh, the artists, Christina and Bita, felt like a real affinity to this story because our own backgrounds and identities are as complex as our heroines. Uh, we, all, we all come from different cultural heritages. Um, I myself am born in Romania and have lived in the States and I have lived in, the, in Estonia for the last three years and uh, have also kind of learned a lot about Estonian history. Um, and uh, both Christina and Bita also have this kind of um, uh, subjectivities and ways of looking at history critically as somebody who is both an insider and an outsider. Um, so our kind of quest to kind of decipher Emily's life and to kind of understand how she became an emancipated woman in Indonesia um, began with these, um, with these 300 um, paintings. And uh, in the US, I only managed to find uh, several copies, lithographic copies of her works. And uh, the title of the show, Orchidlurium, came from a hundred orchids, that, rare orchids that she drew. Um, and uh, these orchids were specially singled out in uh, this uh, uh, glowing review that she received in 1926 uh, in the Los Angeles Times, where all her works were shown at once. Um, and here in this, um, in this Wardian case, you can see this newspaper clipping that um, I discovered uh, where it shows her, you know, as this um, successful artist. And um, some, in the background, there's some copies of her, of her works. 
Um, so the story inspired us very much. Um, even though it happened over 100 years ago, we found it extremely relevant for the present. Um, and both um, Christina, Bita, um, and also Echo um, are reflecting on her, the story of her life um, and the consequences of her choices, uh, both in the past, but also in the present. And uh, we also found out that uh, Emily um, had um, incredible access to the botanical gardens uh, on Java, and she was allowed to travel uh, by herself, which was very unusual for a woman at that time, uh, and uh, draw these uh, specimens of, uh, of rare plants. Uh, and uh, this, unlike her, um, the women in her household, which were mostly Indonesian women, working for her, who, for example, did not have this kind of privilege of mobility um, or this kind of a, a chance to, to pursue their own aspirations. Um, so we became very interested in how, you know, this person, this woman, who, you know, is literally a footnote in her husband's biography, becomes uh, emancipated, but at whose expense? Um, and we were trying to kind of engage with also the experiences of uh, the colonized women and men and peoples in Indonesia that uh, Emily and Andres um, had um, in their household, uh, some of which the Andres uh, captured in his uh, photographs that he took, uh, he took on the island of Java. Um, and um, despite the fact that we've been working on this for over two years, we were unable, never able to go to Indonesia. Uh, because of the restrictions of COVID. Uh, but during this time, we got in touch with, uh, with a host of um, experts and scholars um, and people there, and we've had many wonderful dialogues with them. And uh, I invited to the project uh, Sadia Bunstra, who is a curator, who is herself Dutch and Indonesian, um, to advise us about how to, to kind of bring these voices into the present and to contribute to the research that you see um, in these Wardian cases. Um, and uh, we realized it's very important that uh, the project reflects both on these uh, histories of colonialism, uh, the histories of uh, serfdom that are uh, known in, uh, in Estonian history, uh, but also that the exhibition gives space and, and voice to, to the other side, the histories of um, colonized peoples um, in Indonesia. So my... Um primary motivation to make this film titled Ripoff uh, was the fact that um, when Emilia Sal became uh, this uh, dramatic colonial uh, lady in this um, uh, in Indonesia uh, then um, this uh, luxury and this privilege that she acquired um, it, it didn't just um, um, associate uh, with um, uh, with, with, with luxurious um, uh, leisure, but, uh, but that she seized the opportunity to emancipate as a woman uh, through this, um, um, uh, through dedic dedicating herself to uh, botanical painting. So she become an artist and, uh, and um, this was also an occupation that uh, that in the Estonian context uh, was uh, familiar um, as, uh, as an occupation that uh, Baltic German uh, women uh, would do, and it was something that was meant as a domestic, uh, domestic occupation. So uh, uh, noble women were educated in art, but they were not expected to become professional artists. So this was something uh, that was needed for them uh, to, uh, uh, to become better housewives and uh, to be able to uh, uh, make designs uh, for handicraft, for instance. Um, and, uh, and secondly, yeah, I chose this uh, Baltic German manor as a, as a location for this film, and especially the veranda of which I've already talked. Um, uh, because uh, this is the architectural legacy of, uh, of the Baltic German rule uh, in Estonia, of this, of this colonial history. And also it refers to the history of serfdom of Estonians to the Baltic Germans, even within the context of Russian imperial time. 
And, um, and for me, it was also interesting to think that it was not only that this uh, served them and, uh, and the service uh, for the Baltic German families wasn't only about uh, this inequality and uh, oppression, but, it, uh, but that this Baltic German manor basically was a place where uh, cultural transfer was also happening and where these fantasies of uh, the, um, uh, the noble uh, ladies uh, were um, uh, somehow taken over and were uh, entangled uh, also uh, between, uh, with those of, of, of the servants in the manors. And uh, also the manor is a place that refers to this history of serfdom, but it also um, is a symbol of this um, Western um, culture or the presence of Western, Western European culture to which uh, Estonians um, have aspired to belong throughout this uh, history of uh, um, cultural and political emancipation. There, is, um, there are these uh, scenes that, uh, that are shot in this white room and, uh, and uh, this is the, the, uh, the way to relate to this uh, iconography of uh, botanical illustrations or botanical drawings and Emily Sow's botanical paintings um, because, um, because what, what dominates in, this, in these images is exactly the, um, the white uh, unfilled surface of paper, uh, which uh, for us is this uh, uh, symbol of this colonial power uh, and uh, erasure of, um, of context and erasure of uh, this um, invisible labor of, uh, uh, of those people who um, actually um, provided this, uh, this, these spaces of privilege, who created these spa uh, spaces of privilege to the, uh, to the nobility. And um, the Wardian cases that you see here that were done in collaboration with, uh, with Bita Razavi that contain this research uh, that I put together um, and in collaboration with the artists um, and also uh, Sadia and others, um, they refer to very specific um, kind of inventions at the turn of the century. Uh, these Guardian cases were invented in England and uh, they were kind of the first means to transport plants from indigenous contexts into Europe. And uh, they, they caused quite a revolution because uh, before then these plants would die when they were transported on ships. They would be like suffocated and they would not survive. And uh, because of these cases, it opened up this whole avenues of commerce uh, which kind of built this colonial empire, uh, not only with plants, but also with animals and of course with people. Um, so in the exhibition, these cases are, are a reference uh, to these original Wardian cases that were invented, that were usually kind of very simple uh, constructions, just, uh, you know, basically a box with, with glass so that these flowers would survive. Um, and instead in the exhibition, uh, we are presenting um, different um, historical images uh, from the past and the present, uh, from the Estonian context, the context of uh, Holland, the uh, Indonesian context, the context in the US, and uh, putting together these uh, different associations. Um, and uh, so, for example, here um, you have this case where uh, we have um, Emily uh, sitting in front of her exhibition in Los Angeles. Um, there is also uh, this mention to um, Russian uh, tsarinas who were um, collecting orchids in their greenhouses and sending orchids as diplomatic gifts uh, between countries and giving orchids to Estonia. Um, then there's references to exhibitions of orchids uh, that were staged in, the, in, in Amsterdam in the, in the Netherlands where people, European audiences which were predominantly white were you know, fascinated by them and they were one of the most popular, um, you know, displays ever shown. Um, and then there's also references to contemporary forms of activism that are led by women in Indonesia today uh, because uh, one of the consequences of this kind of um, overproduction of, uh, of visual images and of this kind of commodification of nature has been that uh, 
the landscapes, these landscapes have become exoticized and have become, you know, um, just a means to extract different precious materials uh, or types of wood uh, or different plants. And what has been lost is this kind of indigenous knowledge of, of, this, uh, of, this, of this nature and also, um, of course, uh, what has been lost is the ecosystems and, uh, you know, the lands of the peoples that have been historically uh, living the here. Um, so it was very important for us to put together all these um, all this information and to present it to uh, to to audiences and to kind of especially highlight the role of women. And um, uh, as you can tell from the exhibition, the majority of the the participants are are women. And uh, for me, it was very important, uh, especially given the the theme of this year's biennial and in general to kind of give more space to voices of women, but. Uh, in some cases, as we find here, you know, uh, it doesn't mean that all these women were heroines or they were only making uh, choices that were kind of bad, positive choices for others. Um, and uh, there's also references to the, for example, the um, wife of uh, the Indonesian dictator Soharto, who herself was obsessed with orchids and had an orchid garden built uh, in the in a neighborhood. Uh, and at the expense of other communities. So for me, this orchid became kind of the symbol of uh, being, um, you know, of, of desire, of seduction, of colonialism, of beauty, and the kind of darker histories that, that hide behind this beauty. Karina found also a very nice image of this uh, Baltic German manor, uh, like this veranda. And you can see uh, this uh, German, uh, Baltic German family here on this veranda. Uh, who owned the, the manor house and uh, basically also the land in Estonia. So they were the colonial elite in Estonia. And this is exactly the context where uh, our protagonists are coming from. This, um, this is Andres Sal's uh, home uh, in, um, near Pernu in Estonia. And this is, uh, this is Schloss Fellin, which is uh, in Viljandi in southern Estonia. But basically, uh, there were more than uh, uh, 1,500 uh, manors in Estonia, like owned by, uh, by a very few um, uh, Baltic German families. Mm -hmm. and, and these manners are basically all about the performativity of class, because this, uh, they, um, in the 19th century, these verandas became very, very um, prominent uh, uh, additions to these manor houses. Um, and uh, they, they, they are uh, glass verandas and, uh, and, at, and somehow they refer to this kind of fragility of, of uh, these class relations and these positions uh, because of this uh, also revolutionary um, mood uh, that, uh, and also that which Andres Saul with his writing was representing because uh, he was criticizing the, the Baltic German uh, rule and uh, and the uh, the kind of the the, uh, the inequality and um, the colonial situation, but also these Estonian aspirations to become um, to to uh, to liberate themselves or to emancipate, and um, and and somehow this kind of the, this glass veranda is is re referring to this uh, need of of the Baltic Germans to kind of perform their their ownership of 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 the of the houses and also the, that they would control through the, they would see through the glass and they would control everything that is happening around and how the peasants are working in the landscape. But also this is a place where this, uh, their own uh, kind of uh, lifestyle can be um, uh, performed uh, to the peasants so that there is this inequality uh, very, very strongly um, made um, visible and tangible. And, uh, and, and here, is, uh, here you can see Andres Saal uh, with Emilia Saal and the young child already on the Java Island on a very similar kind of veranda, but now not, not, uh, not as peasants in the landscape living in one of those houses, but now already as, as, as the noble family um, of white people owning this, uh, this beautiful villa in Indonesia and uh, other, other like local 
people would be those whom they would be uh, controlling uh, from this perspective, uh, from the veranda and seeing them uh, carrying out those uh, chores and, and duties in the, in the garden and, uh, and in, in, the, in the plantations that they owned. Yeah, so, uh, and for me it was like very important exactly this, uh, this uh, transformation of this identity of this peasant person becoming uh, this colonizer, white, white colonizer in this uh, Western colonial uh, context. Um, and uh, in, uh, in my films, uh, this, um, uh, uh, the kind of the, the, the hybridity or this kind of the, the identity that emerges from this transformation from the colonized into the colonizer is represented through this um, motif of uh, doppelgangers. So they are female doppelgangers because our protagonist is not Andre Saal, but is Emilia Saal, the artist. And, uh, and, and uh, also you can see in the film called um, uh, Shelter and uh, the one where the manor house is, the manor house is depicted, uh, which is called uh, Ripoff. You see these pa two pairs of doppelgangers appearing and this kind of tension uh, uh, between them uh, is, is called to uh, somehow describe this um, a different perspectives on this um, manorial life uh, or the kind of the, the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized and how this relationship is, is all about performativity and how fragile it is so that one can become the other and, and vice versa. So, um, yeah, and... Um, in, in, in this film called Shelter, which is set in this uh, Tallinn Zoo, it also um, it refers uh, it refers to the uh, the history of, of representation, and it's not only um, the the colonial this kind of Western very Western style colonial representation of uh, coloured people in 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 the in Dutch uh, colony like like. Here, but also uh, here is an example of representation of Estonians um, by the Baltic Germans, um, uh, where you can see this uh, peasant person kind of escaping into that uh, cave in the landscape. And also it refers to this folklore that, uh, that the, <laughs> the Estonians uh, have around this kind of uh, landscapes that have caves, uh, that actually these caves are like uh, the entrances to the hell, to hell. And that uh, the description of hell is very similar to a life in, in, um, in a manor house where, actually, but it's uh, somehow uh, better or nicer or the, the, the peasants have a, a, a bit uh, less, uh, um, difficult life, life there. So it's difficult, but it's not that difficult as in real life, in a real manner. So this kinetic sculpture that prints Emily's um, uh, botanical drawings on the upper level uh, is called uh, Krat, and uh, it evokes uh, an Estonian uh, mythological creature, which is built, uh, made of uh, um, household, uh, garbage basically or whatever unwanted uh, or not needed household uh, element. It was believed that uh, God came to life when uh, three drops of blood were sacrificed uh, to devil by its owner. Um, so my crut is basically a printing machine uh, made of different uh, parts. Um, this upper part is a, is a household machine for Ironing actually in Finland called uh, mankali in um, uh, English mango and it's also common in uh, it was common in Netherlands as well. The lower part, uh, this section is part of a tractor and uh, anyhow different parts are from different uh, creatures uh, and um, it kind of resembles a spider. Uh, um, with the metaphor of weaving um, as well. Krat for me is like how I see it is that it's, um, it's um, the dream of Estonian servants. So for me, it refers to uh, history of serfdom in Estonia uh, as well. Uh, so for, uh, for people who 
didn't have any, um, basically, the, the, all their life was about um, uh, serving and, and about working in labor. I think um, this was some sort of a dream of having uh, free time or having a servant for themselves to, um, to um, do the work they had to do. Um, and that's why I'm bringing it to the exhibition to refer to the role of uh, Emily's servants, which in my opinion enabled um, her practice as an artist. Uh, and this was also something that surprisingly, um, they, uh, Sals managed to um, employ this lifestyle of having many servants, um, plantation workers, and uh, having many people working for them. Um, but uh, yeah, so this creature for me symbolically is kind of that, that, uh, that uh, a servant that uh, gave her the possibility of making the uh, botanical drawings that are produced on the upper level. This also, as I said, it's, a, it's kind of a symbolically print machine, which refers to Anders's practice and background as a printmaker as well. Because uh, I also think the like development of printing technology. Sorry, actually, I don't think it is like <laughs> it's a fact. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the machine is some sort of printing machine as well, and um, it uh, refers to Anders's practice and background as a printmaker. I'm um, bringing this print machine into talk about the role of uh, development of printing technology um, in uh, making um, colonial image um, tangible and uh, promotable for ordinary people in Europe because by uh, producing or mass producing postcards of um, um, colonial lands and maps and uh, all sort of um, uh, information related to colonies, it was possible for the people in the um, homeland to have an understanding of the, the colony that basically belonged to them and to kind of uh, have this image of the successfully controlled um, colony. Um, so yeah, the upper part of the machine produces um, Emily's botanical drawings and the idea for the lower part of the machine and this belt was uh, to show the erased background and context of, uh, uh, which is erased uh, always from Emily's uh, drawings and also in general from um, botanical drawings with the Western uh, practice of making botanical drawings, how they were always on this flat, uh, um, bright background and the idea was to have uh, images of um, destroyed uh, landscape, plantation and plantation workers and uh, um, yeah, um, also including uh, Anders' uh, plantation and his work is on the lower level which uh, um, kind of didn't become possible, it didn't uh, come to the exhibition so at the moment uh, these images are also erased, uh, like uh, the erased background of Emily's uh, works. Um, yeah, but the machine also um, uh, represents the machinery of uh, colonialism uh, for me. And uh, it's crooked, it's rusty, it stands on missing legs. Um, the spider doesn't have uh, eight legs and also um, the sound of the machine and its creaks kind of reveals that it hasn't been really well maintained. It's not, it's not really taken care of. Uh, and it also gives the impression that it's, been, it's an old machine that has been working for years. And despite being crooked and uh, almost broken, it has uh, kind of managed to uh, survive for years. The second film of the trilogy, which is uh, next to uh, Vita's um, uh, shadow installation, um, and was meant as a as a dialogue with that work, um, and uh, that film also has this um, pair of doppelgangers um, that are 
uh, appearing in the setting of this um, uh, Tallinn Zoo. And uh, on the one side, it's uh, um, a film that um, also deals with these uh, uh, questions of representation and like how this uh, colonizing gaze is, is something that changes the identity of the other or like how the other is kind of internalizing that gaze and, and, um, and kind of adopts this, uh, this um, animal features and transforms into this, uh, this creature that, uh, that also not only um, kind of turns into this animal, but, but who also revolts against, against uh, being uh, um, kind of forced to become this animal or somehow. <laughs> represented as, as one. And, uh, and also I use this uh, erotic tension in this, in, both in this manor film, but um, in this ripoff, but also in this, uh, mm, uh, in the uh, film called Shelter, um, um, to, to express this, um, um, exactly this uh, feeling of revolt and uh, and, um, and to make it sort of uncomfortable for the person who, is, uh, who, who owns or bears this colonial gaze. Maybe what our exhibition is doing is exactly kind of trying to provide this uh, Eastern European um, narrative uh, or to make space this, uh, for this Eastern European standpoint within this uh, Western colonial uh, discourse. So to kind of to find this own voice and uh, and own uh, own that responsibility of of, of um, mm -hmm. in connection to whiteness and and um, this kind of colonial gaze. The film trilogy is a collab like it it came to life uh, um, due to this collaboration with um, with uh, three dancers choreographers. Uh, one, the first one was um, Teresa Silva. Um, uh, she's this uh, Portuguese uh, uh, dancer and choreographer. And then uh, they said uh, for the for the manor film there was um, uh, Caroline Posca who who was there um, uh, with her sister uh, Pia uh, Harp uh, as her doppelganger. And then uh, there was uh, Marie Maggie who, um, who performed uh, this uh, part for the uh, last film of the trilogy called um, First. Um, and then this important collaboration um, which we had with, um, with producer and cinematographer um, Eric Norkros. Uh, and also very important uh, for this exhibition particularly is uh, the, um, um, the collaboration with uh, uh, Mert Matis Lil, the composer, mm -hmm. who wrote the soundtrack for the trilogy in the way that um, in this particular space it mixes together because the, the three films are playing simultaneously and, uh, and um, the music uh, or the soundtrack, uh, the soundtracks of the, of the uh, three parts of the trilogy, they mix together in space and make this one musical composition. Uh, and they're also in dialogue with, um, with uh, uh, Bita's um, uh, crack installation. And, and there are these visual links uh, that we have between, uh, between some elements um, in our works that recur um, also or that are reflected uh, or that, that appear also in Bita's work. Uh, like for instance, in, this, um, uh, in the film called Shelter, there is a, a, a very, very big importance that the sunlight and the shadows uh, uh, play. Um, and also in, in this uh, uh, last uh, film of the trilogy called um, uh, Thirst, uh, there, there is uh, a lot of machinery that uh, that um, that is um, uh, related to the to this industry of uh, of growing or like of this phalaenopsis orchids, and actually the third film uh, is is uh, uh, bringing this um, um, 
the the topic of the uh, bringing the orchid as the the symbol of luxury and uh, and um, uh, thirst uh, or appetite for abundance uh, into the nowadays um, and shows the, the 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 orchid industry in Holland that is uh, that is being. Um, Supported or or actually uh, fed by this uh, um, this organic material that comes that is excavated from the Estonian bogs or marshlands. Uh, this uh, this very fragile ecosystems that are um, that um, have a lot of water or preserve a lot of water in them, and uh, the, that um, the film sort of shows the, um, how contemporary Estonians um, um, love the orchid. Uh, the Phalaenopsis orchid is definitely one of the most uh, popular plants uh, that Estonians have in their homes. Uh, but uh, very few people actually make this connection um, uh, between the, the resources that, um, uh, that are uh, between this peat that is um, excavated from the Estonian nature and that is imported um, or exported to, to Holland where it is used as uh, soil substrate uh, for these uh, orchid plants. And, uh, and this ready product is again um, uh, wrapped in plastic and uh, transported back to Estonia where, uh, where the consumers uh, um, really um, indulge in this orchid delirium. So in this Wardian case, uh, we have uh, an example of a reproduction of one of Emily Sal's um, flower paintings. Um, and uh, this um, artistic practice is very rooted in uh, colonial botany, and it belongs to this kind of shared colonial visual arts uh, tradition um, in Europe. Um, and I think one of the first things that you notice is that uh, these flowers are never presented in their native environment. Uh, instead, they are presented against this uh, neutral white background. Um, and another thing that you notice right away is that they are rendered in almost scientific detail, like every kind of line, shadow, everything about the petals, the seeds inside. Um, and in some cases, uh, Emily combined not one flower specimen, but several in the same image. And this was meant to show the different ages of the plant. So you would get one image that would combine a plant that would show how the leaves are uh, when the plant is just beginning to bloom and up to until the plant's uh, maturity. Um, so in a way, these kind of uh, works compress this uh, space and time. Um, and this is very significant because uh, this contributed to this um, um, commodification and this kind of extractivist mindset that uh, allowed people to both consume these images and to make it seem that uh, these, uh, these flowers were ready to be plucked and were ready to be uh, taken and then uh, shown in people's homes or collected in herbariums. Or in some cases, there were collectors in Europe who grew entire greenhouses or, or gardens, uh, combining different uh, exotic plants uh, from, from indigenous uh, uh, contexts. Um, and a big theme of the exhibition is about erased histories uh, and, and narratives that have been repressed or are, are incomplete. Um, so uh, where I'm showing this, this image in and putting back together this context around it. So in, in the Simordian case, for example, we have uh, Emily and Andresal on their um, villa in, in, in Java, on their, on their veranda, and uh, showing their kind of complete transformation into this Dutch elite society. Um, on the other hand, we have a photograph of Andresal peasant home in Estonia, which it looks like extremely modest and shows the kind of origins of where he came from. Um, and uh, there's also histories of, uh, of struggle presented here, um, the moment of the burning of manor houses where also orchids and other tropical plants were um, grown and presented in Estonia. 
Um, there is also this moment of uh, when uh, Indonesia regains independence, uh, when um, in this photograph it is shown how these young Indonesian men are carrying out uh, the portraits of uh, the Dutch colonizers, which were hanging in these manor houses, so kind of like carrying this like weight of history and it's kind of this moment of, of transformation. Um, yeah, here is an interior of a, of a manor house with showing some, some tropical plants um, and flowers um, before, before the revolution. And finally, this is a very um, important image uh, that I discovered that shows uh, the gardens, uh, the botanical gardens in uh, Buitenzorg. Today they are called Bogor Botanical Gardens um, in Indonesia. Uh, showing these Wardian cases uh, being loaded up with plants uh, to be transported then on ships. So all these ecosystems have been kind of completely altered and uh, in some cases these species have been totally lost. They don't exist uh, anymore. Actually, this is also one of the very interesting things about the biography. Uh, this novel, his books are somewhat well known in Estonia. Um, he wrote two novels, White Morning and White Oath, um, about especially about this kind of anti-colonial struggles in, in Indonesia. And uh, in, the, in the books, he's kind of very sympathetic to this kind of uh, Indonesian peoples. And he even compares the Estonian struggle for liberation to become, you know, its own country, to have, you know, like with language and culture and stuff like that. To what, the, to what the Indonesian, and he was critical of the, of the Dutch for imposing this kind of, having this kind of missionary um, kind of goal of, of um, making everybody Christian and uh, kind of uh, not understanding the local cultures, like not having appreciation for the locals. And uh, here, like, it's also a photograph of, of him, Andresal, on this uh, rubber plantation uh, together with the servant. Like, this is a very striking photograph for me. I think, like, it's kind of like, it's so interesting to read this photograph of this, you know, Estonian man dressed like as this kind of white Dutch uh, elite person, um, you know, standing with his cane, like kind of very owning the land, like this is mine, my property. And then, you know, his, his servant or, or gardener, who of course we don't know the name of this person, who is kind of like melting into this tree. Um, and all these images kind of suggest this kind of hierarchies um, and, you know, class relations. So for me, one of the most uh, confusing and puzzling uh, parts of this story was, uh, was uh, uh, Andra's position as a critical person, but also um, as a person who adopted a lifestyle and became part of a system that he was criticizing himself. And uh, more reading um, his texts and his writings, I was more um, triggered because he obviously was a very um, um, clever person, uh, a good observer uh, with a kind of ability of uh, analyzing the situation. And he had a very good analysis of the situation. Uh, whereas he was also participating um, in the very same um, system. So um, it, was also, it, it became kind of personally important for me to understand what was going on in his mind and uh, um, how he was uh, capable of being, uh, having this uh, uh, two kind of um, uh, contradictory uh, sides. Um, and I thought that maybe he was blind to part of privileges that he had. Maybe he wasn't really um, aware of his own privileges. And for me, kind of this uh, relation between these two works, this as a space of uh, privilege, uh, exclusive space. Um, and this work, which is a, a light installation, uh, which imitates the uh, daylight. And it's kind of, once again, doppelganger for uh, another for, for the real, for the natural uh, shadows uh, and real daylight in the space. Uh, I positioned this uh, platform so that when um, the audience enters from the right entrance and they are in this higher um, position having a better view, they actually only see the artificial light and artificial shadows uh, created by a um, lamp uh, placed 
on the roof of the building, which moves and kind of imitates the, um, the movement of uh, sun. Also, um, the color, the kind of um, hue of the light changes from uh, morning, starting with um, rather warmer color to day, daytime, middle of the day, a bit colder, and then the more um, magenta, warm um, evening sunset uh, color. Um, but this whole uh, cycle, day cycle, uh, is compressed and it happens in seven minutes, which also refers to um, the method, the technique of uh, drawing that Emily Rosalisol used for compressing all these different stages of uh, growth of plant in one image, like all these uh, different, uh, um, yeah, exactly stages, like from blooming to, to uh, having flowers and fruits, and so often they were all compressed in one image. Um, so the audience who enters from the uh, left entrance on the um, ground level is exposed first to um, natural shadows, which uh, usually appear uh, on this wall during the daytime, but uh, now it's too late and we see it on the um, other wall. And uh, this, um, these natural shadows are uh, basically um, not visible to people who are on top of the platform. Uh, more privileged people. So this um, uh, simulation of natural day, day cycle that uh, we have in an artificial form there also refers to the colonial recording of uh, nature, which was uh, usually based on representation rather than making real connection with the land or um, landscape. Um, so in dialogue with uh, Christina Norman's uh, film trilogy for Orchidellarium, um, we invited uh, choreographer and dancer Eko Suprianto, uh, who in collaboration with Sadia Bunstra, who is an advisor to the exhibition, um, have created the film uh, Angrek, which means uh, orchid in Indonesian. Um, the film is shown um, on the same screens that Christina's films are shown, and it's kind of like a, an interruption uh, of the films. Uh, it was shown on a uh, shot on uh, location uh, on the island of Java in this exquisite um, uh, rock uh, quarry where mining is still happening today. Um, and uh, in the film, uh, you can see the protagonist Echo and his uh, dance partner, partner sorry, uh, Putri Novalita. Um, and uh, the film is meant as kind of this uh, countering of the exotic sizing gaze uh, of, uh, of the colonizer and the exoticizing gaze that, um, you know, uh, basically is created through this visual culture of uh, colonial uh, botany. Um, and um, the, in the film, uh, they are shown uh, engaging with uh, different um, aspects of the, of the landscape there and of the rock mine, and also presenting this uh, resilient and strong gestures uh, that are also kind of a form of uh, countering this uh, uh, subservient uh, representations of Indonesian people that uh, we see in postcards and in photographs that were produced in the colonial period. Um, and uh, the film uh, is also kind of uh, trying to re-engage with nature and to kind of show that um, the orchid doesn't have to be uh, this, this exotic thing and to show it for what it is. Um, and to kind of show different ways of, of being and of understanding nature from an indigenous perspective um, that is missing from the, from the colonial archives and uh, gives us different points of, of access um, into this story.